Okay, our next speaker is Matt Parkinson, who's going to be um, of a very, something very dear to a functional programmer's heart, getting rid of concurrent mutation. Cool. Um, so this is really a talk about temporal safety. And one of the reasons why I thought it was interesting here is because sort of the capabilities and the sort of work in the sort of more software-defined capabilities give you some ways of doing interesting things in terms of temporal safety. And before I get on to those, what I'd really like to do is explain why I think temporal safety is so hard. So, and it all really comes down to, in my mind, the, what, what I've seen in the literature called the read-reclaim race. So this is, let's take a simple program here. We're going to have, uh, I don't have animations anymore because it's PDF. But, um, we're going to have two threads. One's going to access some shared state through G, and one's going to write to that shared state. And if the first the, the writing thread goes, O1 has become unreachable and could be reclaimed. So this is great, it can go away. But let's restart this program. So we'll restart the race and we'll go again. And now if we operate in the other direction and the re read occurs first, then we can't reclaim that object. So a single read, where it occurs in, in actually what's going on, affects what can be reclaimed. So if you think reading is cheap and you want temporal safety, you're wrong. <laughs> right? That's really important, that just one read of memory can affect what can be reclaimed. So if you go through the literature and look at what people do to solve this, so there's one approach is give up on getting memory back quickly. The other approach is give up on making read cheap. So giving up on prompt reclamation, this is your classic garbage collection world, right? You no longer care about keeping track of what's reachable sort of accurately at any point. You're going to work it out later, right? You stop the world, you trace through memory, you go, oh, that's not there anymore, I can reclaim it. And that way you can keep your read being very cheap, but you can't get the memory back until some length of time later. The other end of the spectrum is making reading expensive. And poster child for making reading expensive is obviously reference counting. Because with reference counting, so when we do this access to memory here, we have to, so let's say we've got still atomic void stars or whatever, as your atomic reference counting thing. When we do this read, what we have to do is a atomic read and increment destination. Now, I'm pretty convinced Simon won't give me that on a machine. Um, if you will, that could be quite cool. <laughs> But this is accessing several bits of memory in one go atomically is kind of what has to happen. So what you find is actually that isn't what happens. And you go and read a book on how to do this. So there's this book by Anthony Williams. This has got a bunch of stuff about reference counting and how to implement it. So the simplest approach is use a global lock. And this is a really good way of making um, reading expensive. Because then if you've got concurrency, it's even a point of contention. So. You can make a lock per reference, which is a bit cheaper, but then you've got to increase the size of every pointer. Or there's some things called split reference counting, where you keep reference counts on the pointy and the pointer, and you do reference counting on one side atomically, then you do reference counting on the other side atomically, and then you go back, and now you've done four or five atomic operations to get it to work. So this is what I mean about making reading expensive. So, oh, no. This slide was animated before. No, it's definitely not animated. So, <laughs> um, there are some things. Uh, so, there's well, maybe it works this way around too. So, there's this paper from, which is for, uh, no, I can't point to anything. So, this paper, uh, PLDI, two years ago, kind of combined lots of stuff. So, it had basically, that's where I found this term read, reclaim, race. And you can sort of look through the literature for things in between giving up on getting memory back quickly and making reading expensive. And you can do both. You can make it expensive and not quickly, right? So you've got hazard pointers which make reading a bit expensive because you have to do an operation every time you read something. But you can get the memory back a bit quicker than like a full GC because you're keeping track in a fairly small way. Uh, this 
one on the far right, which you would see if it was nicely animated, uh, was Keir Fraser's uh, PhD thesis, which has this thing called epoch-based reclamation, which has a much cheaper way of doing the read side, but delays memory reclamation a bit longer. And then I did some stuff a few years back where we kind of tried to combine the two, and there's some guys in Korea who did another thing where we combined the two, and this paper uh, two years ago at PLDI combined the two and added it to reference counting. And kind of, they're all kind of getting to that middle point where they're delaying it a bit and they're making reading a bit expensive and they're tr sort of you're chipping away, kind of trying to get at a better point, um, but it's really tricky. And these papers get increasingly more complicated. So uh, full disclosure, I was working with uh, guys on the right from Korea and submitted a paper on this, where we've made it even more complicated, but slightly faster, right? It's, but it's hard and it's really hard. And, do we want it to be so hard? We could just give up and do something different, right? We could give up on concurrent mutation. So if we didn't have this read-reclaim race, and we didn't have memory sort of shifting under our feet when we're reading something, life is really much easier. So, and this kind of is good to follow the previous talk because ownership to the rescue, right? Ownership types. So Rust has basically taken this path, right? As long as you're not in the unsafe part, right? You can't race, you have like nice structures and it prevents you having to do this read reclaim race. Now, Rust, I, I think is brilliant, it's made great inroads, but there's some things that Rust doesn't deal with so nicely. So ownership like per object in Rust, right? Every object own, is owned by one other object and you kind of can build nice stacks and trees, but when you want to get to more complex shapes, you then kind of have to drop out of that ownership type system. And there have been, so I sort of like, there's so many other ownership type papers in the literature, so let's try some other ones. So this was also animated, but isn't anymore. I forgot this bit too. So in 2005, Tobias Rigstad and Dave Clark did a paper on external uniqueness, which rather than having single object ownership, there's a reference to a region of memory, and that's unique. So there's a single reference into that region, um, and you can track those uniquely, but then within the region, you can have an arbitrary graph. And this kind of frees you a bit from some of the constraints you see in sort of the Rust-style ownership, where you're kind of, everything's completely linear, because you've got sort of like, you have a, tr a tree of graphs. So each graph can refer to other things. And we, so I was very fortunate to work with some people at Microsoft um, in a system that would modify C Sharp to use this to then get them like a nice data race free version of C Sharp. But they didn't use it for memory management. It was still running basically on top of a .NET GC. So they were still paying the cost of having uh, the read reclaim race, but without actually having the read reclaim race, which is kind of interesting. So then, uh, so Sylvan and Sophia, and I can't remember who's behind the bit because it's not animated. Um, they had the pony language. So the pony language also took this kind of external uniqueness point of view. So they have capabilities that represent isolated states. And they are kind of using it for memory management, but not kind of fully. So there are some things still that involve kind of getting some consensus across the threads. Now it's really clever. Sylvan, for his thesis, did some amazing kind of garbage collection algorithms across all the actors, but it's still kind of going, still solving kind of possibly a harder problem than you would like. So the only paper you can read the title of, which is the one we had at Uppsala last year, is where we've been trying to take these reference capabilities and kind of frame them in a different way. So to get really focusing purely on memory management. So if we're using this kind of a type system, which has these capabilities in for isolated state, then how far can we push it in terms of memory management and control of memory management? So, and this is kind of part of something that I've been working on for quite a few years called Project Verona, where we're trying to build this programming language to give really sort of high performance memory management. Um, <clears throat> so I've stolen some slides from Ellen over there, who's, uh, uh, gave a, t a talk on the type system at Uppsala. So basically you've got this kind of graph of objects where there's individual regions can have arbitrary graphs, but then there's kind of single input, a single point in, and sometimes you can't have things, because that would mean there'd be two entry points. So some edges aren't allowed. 
and the type system and kind of the linearity and the type system guarantees that. So this is really capabilities, but in a very software sort of type systems view. And the reason why I think this is sort of really interesting from a memory management point of view is because once you've started partitioning your memory up into pieces, you can start to see, oh, hang on, how do I manage the memory in that region? Well, actually, I could do tracing, or I could do reference counting, or I could do arenas. And you find, actually, right, the, so it's been quite interesting listening to some of the talks today where uh, Robert and I can't remember, lots of people have been worrying about custom allocators. Like, because everyone implements stuff, custom allocators, because this bit of code wants this strategy, and this bit of code wants this strategy, and this bit of code wants this strategy. So if we can build a language that gives you strategies for memory management, and it's kind of built in and kind of clean, and it's easy to change, then actually those custom allocators are no longer a threat, they're a benefit. Um, cool, so I'm going to kind of cut quite short, because I think... It's light, late in the day, and you all had a lot of talks. So uh, the final point I want to make really is, so one of the things we've had to do in Project Verona is come up with a whole concurrency model. So Luke, who's there, uh, wrote the other paper for Oopsla, with co-authors, um, which gives us a nice concurrency model, which kind of integrates very nicely with this, um, which if you want to find out more, either talk to Luke or me or Sophia or Ellen. Uh, yeah. Um, and finally, so if we have a read reclaim race, life is really difficult, right? We are giving ourselves a really difficult problem to solve for temporal memory safety. It's, it just is really hard. So I think concurrent mutation must go. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have questions? Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so one thing I was wondering, the way I would describe the Rust type system is less in terms of a tree or other sort of graph and more as like type system form of separation logic. Uh, and that scales very naturally to like also considering unsafe code and things like that. And so I was wondering if there is a, like is there a nice separation logic framing of your tree of graphs or something like that? Or is it just a completely different universe? Uh, so the... This paper I actually formalized with the views framework as a way of doing a sort of, so there is a sort of separation logic in there for that type system. Um, it, so I, I think so because you're sort of viewing each part as a, as a, as a region of memory that you can access. I, well, but then we have arbitrary aliasing within that part, so the separation becomes hard there, right? Yeah. So it's not, yeah, so it's a, it's a sort of a higher granularity. Of, so you don't get a separation logic within the regions in that sense, yeah. I, so, can, give it, I can give a different answer, but Matthew would be happy with the one you've just given. Well, I mean, I, I would say the advantage of this, in theory, <laughs> is that you can use the uh, heap invariance you get from your, what did you call it, your ownership model, should we say, um, and if you build that into the program logic, then you don't necessarily have to rely on separation logic in order to do that, because things are already contained by the structure of the underlying heap in the language. So in safe Rust, you know, you don't have to worry about whether you are accidentally going to make a pointer, a dangling pointer to a, um, a shorter lived stack frame doesn't happen, you don't have to consider it, and if you're doing a formal model or a proof system, you don't have to consider that case because it simply can't happen. Right, but I want to well unsafe Rust code and then reason about whether that's correct. If you want to do that, then, well, I guess it depends precisely in which way the unsafe Rust code is unsafe. So I think one of the aims we have with Verona is a bit different to Rust, so Rust is very much uh, unsafe. Safe abstractions of unsafe code. I was going to say the opposite way around. Um, whereas in Verona, we're kind of the way I've been trying to sort of pitch it to people at the moment uh, is very much imagine you were designing Go after Rust, not before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, makes sense. Thanks. <laughs> right. 
So, um, very enjoyable talk, uh, even without the animations, you did a great job. Um, the, I'm not sure whether this is uh, a point directed at uh, more at this, these ideas of, of uh, sophisticated ownership types of track things, or at the various um, fancier papers uh, trying to manage the, 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 the race, uh, the, the re reclaim race in increasingly more uh, refined ways. But on uh, what um, Robert was describing on the Morello platform is that uh, one of the things that's emerging is when you have capabilities, they don't just give you memory safety, they allow you to, the, the memory tagging allows you to find capabilities, whether they're in the, on the stack or, or in your data structures or, whatever, or even registers. Um, is that use, is that a useful thing, even if you're not using them for memory protection or anything else at all, just having them tagged and flagged um, for doing this kind of thing better or for more effectively managing the race? So, so I guess the, um, I'll answer. So for sort of the Verona view of the world that I'm sitting in, I don't expect to not know something's a pointer already from a type system. So in that sense... So from a language setting, from you a language you, setting I'm not it. sure it's that. Um, I think from the being able to know if something's a pointer or not and doing your sort of conservative GC <laughs> and not no longer be conservative because you know what all the pointers are and where they point to and how they interact, right? So the uh, cornucopia work that Robert was talking about is like just just having that bit and the bounds is so amazingly powerful in terms of going from not a GC to <laughs> like yeah. Um, but I don't. If you've got a type system in your sort of in that world, I don't see how it helps so much. I think the interop code, the sort of containment, like the the thing that um, David was very interested in in this project was actually now you've got these regions. They can be compartments, and then those compartments could be enforced by Cherry. Okay, so, so it goes the other way, that if you have this level of ownership and understanding, you know where, to, or you have a good idea of where to put the, the boundaries effectively. Yeah, so then you'd sort of go, and then in there, it's that thing, and then you can do all the, and all the sort of ideas that other uh, people present to their own compartments would be super interesting to integrate. Now, mm -hmm. sadly, David uh, moved on from Microsoft, so I, I don't know as I can keep convincing him to do this, but maybe he will. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, like two things on my mind. So I mean, the first is about concurrency in Cherry. Which you know, uh, when you have mutually distrusting or even asymmetrically distrusting parties talking shared memory to each other, uh, you know, Cherry will achieve some of its performance gains through allowing more of that in a slightly safer way. But I remain very concerned about race conditions, and we have demonstrated lots of race conditions between you know mutually distrusting parties and shared memory before, and we are encouraging more of that by telling people, oh, you should use the shared memory thing. So I think there's like a probably an interesting moral there. I mean, we've been looking at a couple of different ideas, such as, well, in this situation, you always want to copy because you just can't, you need the stability of memory contents. So there's like a set of thoughts around that that would be kind of interesting to think about. Um, the other one is, uh, when it comes to memory stability and allocation stability, have you thought at all about these ideas in the context of mutual distrust? I mean, you hinted this a little bit with David's comments and compartments, but maintaining the stability of memory, memory ownership and so on, has security implications and not just, you know, crash-free, use-after-free resistance implications. Yeah, so I think I've just channeled David further on that, but yeah. the kind of compartments and the distrust aspect there capabilities for tracking which bits talk to which. Yeah. But I mean, it seems clear from Darpeng's work anyway that I mean, a next step in Darpeng's work is going to be now you have your compartments, that's great, <coughs> but how do they talk to each other safely? And that discipline for interacting through shared memory, not just bytes, but allocations, I think is really important, interesting. I mean, even if you totally ignore the very hard availability problem, there's a bunch of hard things to do with there. So. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank Max again.